talking about cognition just in very general terms. Um, obviously, uh, everyone will have an awareness that um, there's a vast range of causes um, for people with cognitive impairment and therefore a vast range of clinical presentations. So we kind of jump around a bit talking about ABI, stroke, um, dementia, those types of things, but we're just trying to keep it very broad, um, think about things from an overall perspective. Um, in terms of cognition, it doesn't just include things like memory and insight and problem solving, which is probably what we hear a bit working um, from a mental perspective. What we're talking about in regard to cognition can impact on the way that we communicate with others, which Tracy will talk about a little bit later on, our interpersonal relationships, our behaviours and ability to uh, regulate our own behaviours, as well as a myriad of other things. Um, it impacts on all aspects of our lives, which is why it's so important that it's a multidisciplinary approach in regard to the management of cognitive impairment. Um, so, as it says here, impairments of high-level skills and abilities come in hidden. Um, so, for example, somebody following mild um, traumatic brain injury, um, the tests and things might not show much, but there might be significant underlying issues that are impacting on their ability to manage daily activities. Um, just as a bit of an example of that, about 15 years ago, um, my uncle was working on a building site, he walked over some tarp that wasn't covering anything and fell down four storeys. He obviously had quite a few physical um, issues related to, and injuries related to that um, and spent quite a time in hospital going on kind of months. Um, he also got a knock to the head, but that was kind of the least of his problems at the time. Um, he, obviously these physical issues were, were certainly taking precedence. So when he got home from hospital, um, certainly the issues with his memory were flagged. Um, he'd go to the, sh the shops down the street, get down there, couldn't quite remember why he was there, but kind of developed some compensatory strategies around that. And that was kind of the end of it. Um, six, 12, 12 months, two years down the track, he had some fairly significant issues with his mood with his ability to regulate his behaviour, he was very hot-headed, um, which was a new kind of personality trait, I guess, for him. Um, his insight into his own capacity um, and also his expectations on other people had changed quite a bit um, and that had significant impacts on his relationships with other people, so his wife, who he subsequently divorced from, his three kids, um, and with his work relationships and that kind of thing as well. Um, so, cut to 15 years down the track, he's um, living in a room at somebody's house. He's had uh, quite a lot of difficulty managing finances and paying bills on time and that type of thing. Um, and he's very heavily supported by those three kids who are now in their sort of early 20s and have got stuff that they need to, to manage as well. So I guess the main point of all of that is that physically he recovered really well, um, but it's those ongoing cognitive issues that still impact on him today. Down, <laughs> um, so as I mentioned before, there's a variety of underlying underlying reasons for cognitive impairment. I'm just listing a few off there. Um, but there's also multiple factors that can influence the severity of cognitive impairment. We're not talking just about traumatic brain injury, but that's an example um, just here in regard to post-traumatic amnesia about the um, length of periods in PTA versus the severity of their condition. Um, I guess it just points out here that even with a mild, um, so even with a short, short duration of being in PTA, um, can still have impact on cognitive performance down the track. So um, the diagnosis is not necessarily automatically relative to um, the severity of the condition. So we want to 
to talk a little bit more about some of the impacts that you've seen. I'm sure lots of you have encountered people with cognitive problems in your work. And it can be a little bit tricky to talk about um, cognitive impairment when we're not really specifically talking about a diagnosis. So we're talking really broadly about the kind of problems you might see if you have a cognitive impairment. Um, and we talked about maybe some changes in function, like having memory loss that interrupts your daily life, not remembering appointments, dates, times, challenges with planning and problem solving. So I think when you feel like Nikki said, I'm unable to do your banking and manage your finances, that's a considerable burden on other people to help you out. Um, thinking about your spatial and visual um, relationships and how you can see the world. Just placing things, thinking about poor judgment. You see a lot of people, particularly with brain injury, who experience poor judgment. Um, and also a lot of people that are going to withdraw from activities that have previously given them purpose or enjoyment. Um, and speaking from a communication perspective, um, with cognitive changes, it can have a really significant effect on communication and it's not necessarily the way we might expect. Um, so for example, when we see someone who has aphasia, you know, it might be obvious that they're not speaking well. But with a, someone who has a cognitive impairment or a brain injury, they might be able to speak quite well, but they're not really able to communicate very effectively for a lot of reasons. So some of the changes that you might see are looking at um, the social rules of conversation, so eye contact, turn taking, perseveration on an idea or a concept, um, understanding humour and sarcasm, so you might see people not able to interpret that anymore and really that impacts on the way we converse with others and thinking about Australia which is, you know, we use a lot of sarcasm in the way we talk to people. Um, and you often see a lot of ritual thinking, so on one of our tests we talk about what does it mean when you say to turn over a new leaf, and for most of us we know well, that's to start something new. But you know, someone who's got a cognitive impairment, maybe brain injury, might think of that as actually literally to talk, turn over a new leaf. Um, we can see problems with word find, initiation, and um, in the way in which people communicate in terms of their affect and on their communication. So there's lots of potential impacts of cognitive impairment on the way someone's going to talk. So. In terms of um, understanding cognition, I mean, this is really referred to how it can impact on all areas of function. It's really important to understand um, understand cognitive impairment because it really does assist, assist us to um, add information to the diagnostic process. And I'm sort of thinking of, you know, there's clients that might come in with a slow decline in their memory or increased word finding or forgetting things, forgetting where they put things. That all adds pieces of information to the puzzle. So it's really important to know a bit of background information. Um, and particularly if those issues that we might see with um, cognition are not consistent with the current diagnosis, it might be a cue for us to be liaising with other people to see if we need to do further investigation. And I think we all have a role to play with that. Now, our title was Cognition is Everyone's Business, and that was a really um, core message we wanted to get across today, is that we've all got a role to play in assessing and treating people with these difficulties. Um, it's also really important because ensuring the um, patient's safety in hospital for discharge planning, thinking about things like driving, um, and it's really important that, that all the clients and the consumers or, and family members can understand and participate in their own healthcare and get the most from their treatment. If you're given the impact of cognition or communication, there's a really strong impact on how that will impact on their ability to understand what's going on with their care. Um, it's really important we also sit, support and educate families because people do better if their families are better informed and better aware. And you have to wonder in the case of Nikki's uncle, if we could have gotten in there early as an allied health team, whether or not that could have made a difference to the longer term outcomes with better education and support early on. Um, can ensure adequate referrals are made to other services. So in the same way that if Gate didn't fit in with the picture that you look investigate, that's what we also need to be doing with cognition. So the role of um, OT and speech and cognition, you know, we can absolutely be involved in doing screening assessments and all aspects of the continuum of care. And we've got neuroscience who we can refer to as an outpatient to do more comprehensive assessment, which is um, a great resource. <coughs> but again, we all have a role to play. We really wanted to stress if you see something, say something. So one of the most important things in working with cognition is that we need to really work together as an integrated multidisciplinary team. So we've all got pieces of the puzzle to make a real difference. So these are, we all need to understand on how the things like mental health, personality, medical issues, thinking about deliriums and acute, pretty prevalent, um, past medical history, person's work and education history, and the report of those around them can add to the um, understanding of, of how a client might present. 
So we had a, a recent a recent client actually in the wards um, who had a loss of consciousness and a head strike. And there's a lot of discussion and teasing out as a team as to whether or not this head strike has caused a brain injury, whether or not there are personality issues and whether there are mental health issues. So it really requires lots of us to work towards finding the answers to the problem. So if you gather all this information, there's still questions about cognitive impairment, then we absolutely need to do a cognitive screen or assessment. Um, and that, that way we can do education for families and carers about compensating and supporting them and help with discharge planning. There's a reference at the end about a healthy brain checklist. Because um, I, I know sometimes people feel a little equipped when they come out with understanding what the role might be, or anyone's role might be with cognition. So this gives you a couple of good questions that you might want to go through before making the referrals to OT, speech, neuropsych or someone else just to get a bit of an idea about what might, what might be some of the problems this person's experiencing and whether or not they might be normal or warrant a referral. So there'll be a link there at the end. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about cognition and communication in a little bit more detail in my three or four minutes that I've got before the end. Um, but I really want to stress how important communication is and how we build and sustain relationships without it. That's what makes us individuals and humans is, is our communication. And cognition and communication work together so closely. And all of these things like attention, concentration, memory, problem solving, executive function, all impact on the way we communicate with others. So as speech pathologists, it, it's a really important role for us and it's working with people that might often be able to speak well but um, have higher level communication difficulties. So if I just give you a bit of a brief look at this, really a lot of communication is non-verbal and there's some really variable stats on whether it's 60 or 90% but essentially a lot of our communication is non-verbal. When you think about so intricate and so hard to teach and describe, you think it makes a difference how close someone stands to you, how comfortable you feel, how they speak, whether or not they touch you or not in the conversation, how much they look at you, whether it's too much or not enough. And there is, you know when you know when it's not right, you know when you feel uncomfortable. Um, you know whether their voice quality feels different, um, rhythm, intonation, and stress. Does their pitch go up at the end so that you know they're asking a question? And all these things can be impaired with brain injury. So it's really kind of complicated when there is a mild brain injury that impacts on all these areas. And I just wanted to show you a little clip that might give you a bit of an example of um, someone who speaks well but has some problems with communicating. And the impact, I guess for you to think about when you're watching it, the impact it has on social communication, this person's relationships, friendships and capacity to work. Fingers crossed for YouTube. So it's missing a little bit at the start, but there's an interview asking this guy about inhibition, um, and then he'll start talking in just a moment. It's about so three minutes. Whatever. Um, so to disinhibit means that we stop inhibiting the impulse to swear, or the impulse to get angry, or the impulse to, to tell a member of the opposite sex how sexy they are, or how unattractive they are. Mm -hmm. um, do you think you have problems screening what you say before you blurt it out. Okay, you're talking about the little voice that's in the back of your head that helps prevent you from saying something? Yes. Huh. I don't have one. The back of your head being the part You know, of like, um, I had a friend of mine, unless you're around me and or you know me, um, a friend of mine, she would call it, they were, she called them um, backhand slap compliments. You know, I was complimenting somebody, but it didn't look like it. I was insulting them. Or so you don't look nearly as fat today as you did. Yes, exactly. And so she said, finally, she was like, "Mike, you can give me a backslap compliment." I'm like, "Yes." So, what problems has that absence of the little voice in the back of your head? Caused? I've lost a lot of friends. Can you explain? Um, after my car accident. Um, I had maybe one really good friend from Lola who stuck around with me, and two or three other ones besides my family. I've lost, just from Lola, I lost about 10 friends because they could deal with me and my quirks, I guess is a better word. What are the most significant quirks? Is this 
inability to have a filter of what you say first thing yes. you say. It's gotten better, but I still have problems. What was the last problem that comes to mind that you had in terms of a, a blurting something out? We were, um, I think this was at church, and my wife was like, you know, I just went to the bathroom and I thought I had it I thought I had it right here. Of course, I perked up, had it pointed out, and said, hey, look, everybody, my wife's straight hair. You know, it's funny because, you know, I may do it for you or less. But I can't say, okay, well, we'll diet it or we'll get rid of it. And I've been able to tell in the first time I met you and the two interviews that you do have a sense of humor. Yeah. Um, and that was probably a big part of your personality before you got hurt. So the way you get through life. You have problems today being able to figure out what is funny and what's offensive. For me, everything is funny. Um, but if you're not around me for a long time, um, most of the stuff that sounds like this coming out of my mouth is offensive. Um, my friend who has a huge speech disorder, she gets me. Um, so I guess I just wanted to pop that on to highlight how someone can communicate well, but it's what they're saying and the way they say it that can really cause them lots of communication and cognitive problems. And, obviously affect their lives in more ways than might be visible, say, in a new patient setting when in an artificial environment. So, um, you know, I guess that if you see something, say something so we can get in there and um, treat it early and work with the family so that perhaps we can preserve some of their social relationships and um, opportunities. And I think that was where we were.